so in a couple of months, uh, Doom will be 20 years old. Now, those of you old enough to remember Doom's launch, I find that thought a bit uh, troubling, sobering, whatever. I know I do. But since John here, John's here with us, I think it would be much better not to worry about the passing of time, but instead to celebrate. Now, most of the game, it is John. Uh, John, by the way, uh, John's one of those people that the camera really loves, so I, I had such a difficult time choosing a, a illustration there. Well, most of the game was ended in the early 1980s. Uh, a decade, decade later, not so much. And yet we are here today at this International Festival of Independent Games 20 years later. How did that happen, actually? How did independent games make a comeback? And most important for us today, did Doom have anything to do with that story? Now, if you think about how often today's indie and art games pay homage to the 8-bit world, it may seem a little strange to think of Doom and Quake as preparing the way for these kinds of games. Wasn't the first-person shooter sort of the dominant, mainstream kind of game during the 1990s? Didn't Doom and its big brother Quake lead to those big budget, big team, huge launch, AAA titles that dominated the game industry later? You know, I, I get the reasons for separating Doom and Quake from the indie movement. Still, I don't see it that way. My take is that Doom opened up a new creative space for game developers and players, and you guys are taking advantage of that. So I'm going to organize my thoughts around one piece of the history of Doom, that is the history of the game engine. Saying that in software, well of course where Doom and Quake were made, invented the game engine is an important thing to say. But that statement overlooks the key point about the game engine's historical impact. It also defined a new structure for game software by separating the execution of core functionality, the game engine, from creative content that makes the game experience, the assets, that's what we call it today. So when I say game engine, I mean two things about game technology. I mean the engine itself, and I mean the architecture that separates the engine from assets. So months before releasing Doom in December 1993, its software issued a news release. It promised that Doom would push back the boundaries of what was thought possible on computers. This press release, and I encourage you all to go back and take a look at it, is really a remarkable document. It summarized stunning innovations in technology, gameplay, distribution, content creation, and so on. It also introduced the term Doom Engine. This term described the technology under the hood of its latest game software. The news release also promised a new kind of open game made possible by its game engine technology. And we're going to return to that point about the open game in a minute. But did it really invent the game engine? Let's talk about that first. Google's Ngram Viewer, which you see up there, gives us one method for studying the emergence of the term. And it confirms its bravado about the game engine. The term first appeared in print during the year after Doom's launch. In fact, it occurs quite frequently in 1994, the year after the launch. We find it in Andre Lamoth's Teach Yourself Game Programming in 21 Days, but tricks of the game programming gurus, again by Lamoth and John Radcliffe, articles in PC Magazine and the inaugural issue of Game Developer. Uh, and no surprise, the official Doom Survivor's Strategies and Secrets by Jonathan Mendoza. Google Books, and there I'm comparing it to the terms game program and game software, you'll just see Game Engine just sort of jumps out there uh, in their early 1990s, the blue line. So Google Books does identify a few citations before 94, by the way, but they're all false hits, some of which are quite amusing. Uh, anyway, this analysis suggests that the term game engine arrived with Doom and support the argument that the invention of this game technology was a discrete historical event. We can say 1993, it's software, uh, the invention of the game engine. Well, anyway, many of you know it's <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put up a photo of John just so you would laugh at it, but yeah, actually I did. But this is uh, you know its story. So I will focus on the game engine and its impact. John's going to talk a little bit more, and we'll have plenty of time in Q&A to talk uh, about Doom. Some context. Here are the Dramatis Persona. You see them up there. Uh, in 1990, Carmack and Romero were the key figures in a team at SoftDisk uh, that was tasked with producing content for a bi-monthly game disc magazine called Gamer's Edge. 
Carmack's solution to the problem in, to the problem of implementing any S-like horizontal scrolling on the PC became the tickets, the team's ticket out of SoftDisk, and they founded their breakaway company in software as a result of that. Yet the separation from SoftDisk was actually very gradual. They continued to produce games for SoftDisk. Uh, around that time, Romero also came into contact with Scott Miller of Apogee Software, a successful shareware publisher. And after showing Miller the famous uh, Dangerous Dave and copyright infringement demo, they also <laughs> began to produce uh, software for him, too. So now they had overlapping commitments, which in turn produced a brutal production schedule. Plus, they were, of course, developing their own projects and developing technology as well. So it met, it met this brutal schedule in part by producing games in series, such as the first series of Commander Keen games, Invasion of the Vorticons, uh, which was published between late 1990 and the middle of 1991. It featured Carmack's smooth horizontal scrolling. He used other projects to make progress with 3D rendering, which seemed like a promising technology, maybe for another uh, Keen trilogy. Uh, Carmack and Romero, around this time, began to call the shared code base for these three games, the Keen games, the Keen engine. The engine then was a single piece of software that produced common functionality for multiple games and made it easier to produce multiple games. The idea of licensing such an engine as a standalone product to other companies emerged quickly from that. It briefly tested the idea by offering a summer seminar in 1991, 1991 now, a couple years before Doom, to potential customers for the Keen engine, again, more than two years before Doom. They demonstrated, I'm sure it was John, demonstrated a design of a Pac-Man-like game during the workshop and waited for orders to pour in for this engine. They, in fact, received one from Apogee. Uh, Romero, John, recalled in uh, the oral history I did with him that uh, so they get the engine. So they get the engine, which means they get all the source code to use it. Apogee then made one game with its engine, BioMenace. Then they made their own engine after getting access to its code. And then, as John put it, they didn't license any more tech from us. Okay, so while the trial balloon of, license, of the licensing concept was a failure, the game engine stuck as a way of des designating a reusable platform for efficiently developing multiple games. John later recalled that, I don't remember at that point hearing of an engine, like, you know, Ultima's engine, because I guess a lot of games, why am I talking like John? That's John. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> because I guess a lot of games were written from scratch. In other words, game programs had been put together one game at a time back then in the 1980s. But why call this piece of software a game engine? Well, I'm sure a lot of you know Carmack and Romero were both, are both automobile enthusiasts. And as John explained, the engine is the heart of the car, this is the heart of the game. It's the thing that powers it. And it kind of feels like it's the engine and all the art and stuff is the body of the car. Well, so we can now make a more precise entry in our chronicle. Its software invented the game engine around 1991 and revealed the concept no later than the new press release in early 1993. Okay, so that was some historical background for you. Doom's game engine is indeed a significant event in the history of game software, but what does this have to do with games as a new creative platform? Car Carmack noted the impact of that is John Carmack, by the way, that's uh, Brody Condon's uh, uh, 650 polygon John Carmack. Um, Carmack noted the impact of Doom in an interview several years ago. He remarked that Doom was, a, and I'm quoting him, a really significant inflection point for things because all of a sudden the world was vivid enough in a game world, I presume, that normal people could look at a game and understand what computer gamers were excited about. Doom, Doom and the game engine technology that powered it marked the beginning of the modern computer game, not only as a technical achievement, but as a springboard for a whole host of changes in perception and play. Along with Doom, we got network player communities, fascination with the sights and sounds of games, and concerns about hyper-realistic depictions of violence and war. And we got something else. Most of us would agree with Carmack about the inflection point in computer gaming circa 1993 and its after effects. 
A specific example close to my heart is the history of machinima. Before there was machinima, there were quake movies, which Carmack separation of the game engine from assets simply made possible. Demo files were a particular kind of asset file in both Doom and Quake. Remember the separation of the, of the assets? <coughs> A few of the early Quake players figured out how to change these files to produce player-created movies that the game engine could then play back. <coughs> the result was the Ranger's Diary of a Camper. Can you read what it says up there? It says, yeah, it's John Romero. That's the punchline to, uh, to the Machinima piece. Um, the results, so the result was something like Diary of a Camper, Quake done quick, quick, all these early Quake movies that followed. So it had not anticipated movie making, but it enabled it as an affordance of their game technology. And that's really the point. Doom then was a historical moment for games as a different kind of creative space. The media scholar Lev Manovich has described the impact of Doom as nothing less than creating a new cultural economy for software production. He had in mind when he wrote that the full implications of the game engine, particularly its software model of separated engine and assets. Manovich described this new economy as follows. Producers define the basic structure of an object and release a few examples, as well as tools to allow consumers to build their own versions to be shared with other consumers. Okay, so in other words, Carmack and Romero had opened up access to their games in a fashion that might be construed in other media as giving up creative control, letting people change your stuff. And yet, its move was not a concession. They embraced its implications as the company focused increasingly on technology as a foundation for game development. They encouraged the player community to modify their games by changing the assets, not changing the engine, and worked with third-party developers who made new ones on top of its engine. So Carmack's support for an open software model can be explained, I think, in part, and I hope John will talk about this a little bit, by his background as a teenage hacker. Now, he had created a robust model of content creation that would allow players to do what he had wanted to do, change games and share the changes with other players. Carmack's attention then shifted as a result to improving the technology rather than working on game design. Let's note here that users, meaning players of course, played a significant role in shifting its focus to the game engine as a content creation platform. After it released Wolfenstein 3D in 92, Dedicated players hacked the game and inserted characters like Barney the Dinosaur and Beavis, Beavis and Butthead. This made an impression on Carmack and Romero, as it, as it should. Uh, Michael Adcock's Barneystein 3D patch and others like it documented the eagerness of players to change content, even though the game, that game, did not offer a really easy way to do this. Romero, uh, John recalled in his oral history that Wolfenstein 3D demonstrated that players wanted, and quoting him, to modify our game really bad. <laughs> he and Carmack concluded about their next game that, I'm quoting him again, we should make this game totally open, you know, for people to make it really easy to modify because that would be cool. Carmack, in other words, responded to perceived demand. He created a software structure that allowed assets such as maps, textures, and demo movies to be altered by players without having to hack the engine. Stability of the engine was important for everybody because it was the way of enabling distribution and sharing of new content so other people could see the same thing, the thing that you had created. Moreover, access to assets encouraged the development of software tools to make new content, which then generated more new modifications, maps, and design ideas, and so on. Its corporate history boasts to this day, if you go to the website, that after Doom was released, the mod community took off, giving the game seemingly eternal life on the internet. So Manovich pointed to the implications of the changes introduced in Doom in terms of support for content modifications and reuse of the engine, but he does not say very much about the motivations. David Kushner, who wrote a history of its software, um, says that Carmack's separation of engine and assets resulted in a radical idea, not only for games, and I'm quoting him, but really for any type of media. It was an ideological gesture that empowered players and in turn loosened the grip of game makers, end quote. At the same time as Carmack and Romero had, had predicted, uh, it was also good business to do that. 
Eric Raymond took up exactly this theme in The Magic Cauldron, by the way, by bolstering his case for the business value of open so source software by analyzing its decision to release the Doom source code. Okay, I'm finishing up here. Uh, the media artist and museum curator, Randall Packer, noticed something especially, this is about 1999, noticed something especially important about the cultural shift that occurred after the release of Doom and Quake. He observed that games have become the exception among interactive arts and entertainment media because game, development, game, excuse me, because game developers did not view the letting go of authorial control as a problem. Think about that comment for a minute. He meant that game developers were unique in the digital arts, not because of the nature of the content they produced, rather it was their willingness to create an art form that invited others to alter that content and add to it. I'm pretty sure in 1999, he was talking about the kind of open game, as it had promised, that Doom introduced to the world. So that's my connection uh, from Doom to Indy. Uh, my narrative suggests that, then that the logic of game engines and open design meant that it would become a different kind of game company. The PC as a relatively open and capable platform during the 1990s was also conducive to this logic. In line with Carmack's focus, its game was now technology. A few years after Doom, he reflected that technology created the company's value and that there was not much added by game design over what, uh, and he said this famously, a few reasonably clued in players would produce at this point. And if you think about it, the bridge dating from open games and reasonably clued in players to independent game developers and artists is not a very long one. Doom was indeed, as Carmack said, the inflection point. Okay, so thanks for listening to me. Uh, I'm going to introduce John to you now, ask him a couple of questions, and then we're going to throw things open, or John can say whatever he wants at that point. <clears throat> Let me say just a couple of things about John Romero that don't fit the normal, I guess, uh, introduction style and titles and things like that. Um, one is that I'm not sure if everybody knows this, maybe everybody does, that John was, Doom was launched when he was roughly 25 years old, but he'd already been coding for, what, 12, 13, 14 years at that point. He produced dozens and dozens of games through his late childhood, teens, and so forth. So that's one thing uh, that's fascinating about him, that he's basically been coding now, what, 30 plus years, right? Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is, uh, of course, John's a preeminent coder, programmer, uh, designer of games. Uh, one thing maybe some of you don't know is that he's also one of the leading collectors of games and of game history around. In my world, I work in a, I'm a curator in a library. Collectors, you know, collectors of rare books, museums, collectors of arts, play this crucial role in defining what the culture will be because they collect the artifacts that we then see in museums and libraries. And John is, besides everything he's done as a producer and developer, he's also playing this role of collecting and documenting game history as well. Uh, so, John, did you want to talk? Do you want me to launch us some questions? Or it's kind of up to you. Yeah, I'm going to talk about Alter the microphone right here. Okay. Um, I just want to say thanks for having me here at Indicate. I'm pretty humbled and uh, I think it's pretty awesome that everybody is still remembering my games after 20 years. Um, is this thing on? Okay. Um, so, uh, in talking about the, the modifiability of, of uh, our games, um, it's interesting to note that um, one of the uh, one of the I guess uh, tenets of of, uh, of people who have done something for a long time, let's say making games or or uh, cooking food in the kitchen, etc., um, you get to a point where uh, uh, always be cleaning is something that's very important to the process of doing what you do. And um, in a kitchen, a really great chef basically cleans up all the time. And in, uh, in game programming, uh, we're always trying to clean uh, our, keep, keep our core uh, source code clean of, of random code that doesn't belong, commented code that, doesn't, that shouldn't be there. Um, and also files that shouldn't exist that aren't being used again, or aren't being used in your game. Um, you know, because it just clutters up everything and it's not really indicative of, of what the game is about if you just have random garbage sitting around. So we're always cleaning up the files that we use that, are, that aren't being used. 
and um, in keeping the file size small uh, and keeping the number of files small was really, really important. It was actually uh, on the Apple II, games on the Apple II were basically one big file, typically. And it was, it, it was almost like just the memory <coughs> of, of the game in memory. And so when you ran the game on the Apple II, you're running one file. Um, and, uh, and when the games were cracked, they were cracked as just one file. So I got very used to um, running games that were just one file. And that just seemed very nice and clean to me. And, and John Carnack and Tom Hall who were also edited software. So um, when we were making our games on the PC, we wanted to keep our file count very small. Um, and, and even when we were making our own games on the Apple II, we tried to just make them as just one file. So that kind of goes counter to the modifiability thing, which is uh, like pulling out the data from that code, because when we're making our games, we put the, code, the data in the code, we put it together into one big file. Um, and so uh, that's, what, that's kind of how we delivered our games at the very beginning, but as soon as we started making our, uh, like the engine concept, where we decided, you know, we're gonna reuse this piece of code to make multiple games. Um, Basically, back in the day, everybody would just write the game from scratch over and over again, and we kind of, we kind of did that with our games as well. Like we, when we were going to make a, a game series like Commander Keen, um, we would make an engine, but then we would make it so the the, the data was separated from it, and then and it'd be three chunks of data basically. Um, and uh, even with Commander Keen, we kept the data separate. Uh, from the code, but it was also multiple files. Um, there were, you know, discrete level files uh, with Commander Keen, so people could, they couldn't really modify those levels because we compressed them because they needed to fit on a disk, and that really did help the modifiability of the games because the compression that we used was, um, was, was kind of linked into the executable itself, so you'd have to break the executable apart to, to, to decode the data, and that was just really difficult to do, but when we uh, released Wolfenstein, um, we used the same kind of uh, compression method, but people wanted to modify Wolfenstein so badly that they started cracking that compression method, which was very difficult to do, because they had to decompress multiple ways to get to the data, and we used different methods of compression that were even customized beyond the, the <coughs> standard versions of those compression methods. So people really, when they when they cracked Wolfenstein's levels, that was when we were like, wow, this is hardcore cracking. Like anyone who did this, it's, it's akin to basically uh, cracking copy protected disks on an Apple II using quarter tracking. So it was really difficult and we're like, they want to modify our games really bad, we need to just open this up. Like they need to, they need to do what they want with it. Um, but we also need to retain the image of what, like the original of the game. If, if, um, if you talk about you know an actual painter's painting in a, in a in a museum and people wanting to make them you know change the painting, you have to make a copy of that original painting. Otherwise, you've ruined the original and it can never be used again. So with the with Doom, um, we created a file format called WAD. Where's all the data? That's what it stood for. <laughs> it's a it's a WAD of data, but we needed something to the you know for the letters to make sense. And then uh, the SRC made GOF files, and everybody kind of copied that idea. Um, but inside the WAD, we identified the original data, like the original painting, the original game, as IWADs, and the ones that people created that were separate from our stuff as PWADs. So the modifications of everybody else were, were identified differently. So we knew always what the original was. Um, and that's probably not a significant point uh, in, in the discussion of it, but to us it was, it was like, what is the original data? It can't be changed. So, uh, so anyway, you know, we were we were very um, excited to see what people would do after the, diff you know, we knew that there would be more mods when we opened it up versus Wolfenstein, which had several mods, but it was hard to break. Uh, Doom, we just opened it up, and then that's where the community really exploded. Um, also, with the demos, talking about demo recording and sharing demos. Um, we actually created all the demo recording uh, code um, in our Commander Keen game. And we basically kept the same file, uh, the, the command line commands to record and all that, but we only used it to show gameplay as like an arcade or track mode. We didn't actually let players record their own demos, but we could have if we, if we just allowed that to, to happen. Um, but not until Doom did we actually open that for people to record whatever they wanted. 
Okay, thanks, John. I'm going to ask one or two questions, and then I'm just going to open the floor, and we can, uh, I can see you all right now. Yeah, I get this way, I can see you. Um, I'll call you out. John, I have just one question, I guess, the front of my mind, which is, how do you, did you guys talk about the games as potentially a different kind of art form where a game would be a medium kind of like, I don't know, like paint or chalk as a medium that other people could paint with, you know, your games, you know, did, did you have conversations about that sort of thing? Did you have some sort of vision about people uh, actually going in there and making new stuff using your game, or was that something that just kind of happened and you rode the wave with it? Uh, so, no we didn't. <laughs> we had no idea. We were, you know, we, we knew that um, letting people modify the game, we thought that there were going to be kind of tweaks. We didn't know there would be like the Aliens Total conver Conversion or the Star Wars Total Conversion. So people came, at, came up with the terminology Total Conversion, which is basically, you know, not licensing the engine to make another game, but basically making a whole other game from our, our finished game and just releasing it as if it's a whole other game. So um, the earliest stuff that came out was were, were total conversions that people like grabbed onto that terminology and, and that's kind of where um, uh, Final Doom came from. Final Doom basically has two total conversions in it. Um, the, the TNT evolution and the Plutonium stuff. So um, that was you know that was kind of an, just a, a result of, of you know 30 plus level designers getting together and organizing to create this megawatt kind of thing that they call it total conversion. And it resulted in commercial products, much like Counter-Strike was, was the same thing. Um, but yeah, when, when we were talking about uh, the game itself, we didn't think of it as it's a canvas and we're giving people the paint and stuff to create anything. We're just like, let's see what they do with the game. You know, it was just like, we're just gonna, you know, create this cool thing, open it up and see what happens. And there were a lot of vectors for things to happen. Um, the fact that in the games we had par times for, for how fast we could get there provided, you know, this quantifiable uh, thing that people could com compete around, which is getting through the game faster. And then people um, basically created all these other ways of competing, which immediately uh, created a site called the Doom Honorific Titles. And people had to provide demos of them getting through the game you know, like the Schwarzenegger title, where you're getting through the game just punching everything, and you can't, you know, you can't use a, a weapon at all. Um, and they, had, you know, they, they have a lot of different terminologies, and, and the site still exists today. If you want to do a Google for Doom Honor of titles, you'll see the demos over all the years of people trying to get these titles in the fastest times. It's like Doom done quick, Quake done quick, where people put together these 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 demos of themselves getting through the game very very quickly, and. Um, after seeing that, uh, you know, just that vector of modifiability and people's uh, engagement around the game, um, right after releasing Quake, I, I uh, came up with the idea, and, it, and still haven't done this um, yet, <laughs> but basically the idea of challenging people to get through a level really quickly and post their, their um, demos was, was something that was kind of happening on a website, but I wanted to, to kind of put that in a game. I wanted the game to have um, challenges around every one of its levels, much like I guess the way Portal does. Portal has, you know, the different rankings for different for uh, for, for getting through the, the game uh, in different times. But uh, but I, what I wanted was like a leaderboard built into the game. So you're playing a single player game that's also a multiplayer game, and it's also a game that has challenges built in around leaderboards and you know and basically around the world. So people could post to a central server through the game itself. The game would basically go, okay, you're gonna challenge, you know, E2, M5, and the guy who's got the highest score is plot with 40 seconds, and go, and it starts recording you playing the game, and at some point, you know, if you get on the leaderboard, it would tell you, do you wanna submit this? And, um, and I don't think that that's happened yet in, in the game, but I'm excited to do that, because I love, uh, you know, Deathmatch is all about competition, and uh, any way that we could get competition more organized inside the game, the way Rocket Arena, um, you know, Quake 3, you know, that's, that stuff, um, I guess, is just even more, you know, there's more excitement around the game, and of course, eSports just took off, and, and it provided, you know, lots of money for people who are really competitive. Okay, well, I just mentioned uh, the archivist, the person who put uh, the Doom on Olympic Tiles archive together around, and uh, that's also a history, by the way, that's not just the game, the Doom, or any other game, you know, it's a packaged product that you can run, but also all of those games that people 
are also part of history. I'm going to ask you one more quick question. I'm going to paint, I'm going to ask you to paint a picture of what it was like. And that was when you would see like the Wolfenstein 3D, the Barney Stein mod or something. What were the circumstances of you catching hold of that stuff that was going on out in the community? And how did you guys share it? How did you react to it? What did it make you do? Can you paint that picture for us a little bit? So, um, at ID, uh, we got on the internet, I think it was around the end of 1992 when we moved into the town East Tower uh, in Mesquite, Texas. Uh, before that, we were in an apartment. And uh, so we moved into an actual building, um, and then we actually got an internet connection in that building. Before then, it was just a modem, and we would just call up. So we were, we were not really online that much. And um, in uh, 92 and in 93, while making Doom, we, were, we had an internet connection, we were doing email, and we were checking uh, Usenet, and uh, on the Usenet at that time, they had the top 100 games every week posted. And so we got, to, we basically were, every week we would see this list and we're like, we're getting, you know, look at where Wolfenstein's at, look at where Keen's at, and oh my god, missed, you know? And so um, we were competitive even in just trying to get a high ranked game. Um, but uh, at, that, at the time, we, uh, we were so focused on making the games that we weren't really out there scouring around for um, looking, just looking to see what people would do. We would just kind of see in magazines stuff that's printed and go, oh wow, that's cool, people are doing that. But as far as I can recall, we never ran any of the Wolfenstein mods at work because we were making the game constantly. Um, when Doom came out and, uh, and then the mods came out, we did run levels and mods for Doom, but before then, we didn't run anything. Uh, we didn't run any mods for, for Wolfenstein. Um, yeah, we, we, we worked really hard for a lot of hours. Um, Doom took us a year. Wolfenstein only took six months. Um, and uh, and Keen took three months. So it was, <laughs> we were just like doubling our, our times. Um, but yeah, we didn't, we didn't spend time really cruising the internet and looking for stuff. We were just working really hard to try and, um, to try and uh, I guess, get beyond what we were doing. It was, it was difficult in making get beyond Wolfenstein because we were used to those 90 degree walls and the fixed heights and the full bright uh, brightness of the, of the world. And so when we um, put the it added capability into Doom to, to having darkness and floor heights and textured floors and ceilings and lights with you know strobe lights and flashing and moving stairs and just everything in there, um, it was hard to take advantage of that because we were so used to making Wolfenstein levels. We, we made like 60 of them. And, um, and then we did Spear of Destiny, which is another 20. So we made, made like just Tom and I 80 levels of all these 90 degree things. And so the first Doom levels that we made were all these 90 degree things with fixed heights and really bright, you know, the sector, the sector light values were all the same. And so, you know, it was, um, it took us months to try and figure out what is gonna be the new way that we design this game. And we were still also trying to, you know, formulate like design directives to push us further. And so um, so with Doom, uh, at one point, uh, I came up with the uh, what I call the abstract design uh, level design style, which is just, I'm not gonna make anything that looks realistic. I'm just gonna make something, make something that looks really cool and looks cool and feels cool to move around in. And um, and then play around with that, you know, you know, play around with the scale, of the, the, the size of the rooms and the hallways um, coming up with the idea of contrasting gameplay, contrasting visibility, like the, the darkness and, and the lightness of rooms, the hugeness of outdoors and the smallness of corridors, and throw contrast through the entire game. So it kind of felt like a roller coaster where people were in a level. Um, places, you know, areas of suspense where there wouldn't be fighting, but then there's a crazy amount of fighting. Um, and that was just my design style because other people had different design styles. So Sandy Peterson's was a very, you know, constant trickle of comment through the whole game. Um, but, you know, it was, it was uh, coming up with the rules, and one of the important rules was uh, when you look at a room in Doom, you can, you, you, we can't uh, have ever been able to make that in Wolfenstein, even with mods and stuff. You just could not make a room that you could go, that could, that could be Wolfenstein, we're not going forward. So, it, it, so in, in keeping with that same idea, when we were making Quake, we also basically said, you can't look at a room in Quake and make and make that in Doom. That you know, so look up, make cool stuff on the ceiling, make stuff that's 3D, you know. Um, and so that really pushed us to looking at everything that we were making and, and 
And so we did. We spent a lot of time on just the craft and the invention of, of um, a, new, a new thing that we hadn't seen before. And it took up all our time. So we were not on the internet doing things. We were, it was, it was, we were on the internet, I guess, um, just checking out the, the uh, top 100 and email. That's about it. Not even really, there weren't that many web pages back then. That was in the age of like web crawler, the, the browser, you know, the, the search engine for way before, you know, all the Vista and Google and stuff. Okay, um, throw it open to you for questions. I mean, you're welcome to ask me a question, but I have a feeling your questions will be for John. You were up first. Yes, um, you mentioned code cleanliness and focus and purpose as key programming concepts that were key to a good engine. Are there any other programming principles that you um, <clears throat> braces go on the next line. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pet peeve that's already out. We, we did keep, uh, it was easy for me and John to have a, uh, a coding style that matched because we both agree that you know, braces do belong in the <laughs> um, And uh, uh, cleaning was obviously important. Uh, at the very beginning, it was it was like keeping the file sizes as small as possible. Um, that was a really big deal uh, because it's easy to just blow up your data and then you don't fit on a disk and then you're rescoping your game. Versus, I want to put all these levels on you know in this game and then it's like, oh no, we don't fit on the disk. How do I make it fit on the disk? And like I even had to do some some sick things like take level files and turn them into object files and then link them into the executable and then compress the executable. <laughs> That's the only way that King 2 and 3 actually made it on a 360K disk is by taking data and compressing it, you know, in the inside the executable that we use, the LZEXE to, to compress the whole thing down. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we, uh, you know, keeping, keeping everything clean was really important. Um, where people could put their levels and people could download the levels. But also, um, 
there was a company called Wizard Works that uh, basically scraped a ton of levels from everywhere that they could, put it on the disc, and, and, uh, and sold it. It was called the D Zone. Um, and then they did for Heretic, they did H Zone and stuff. But basically, they, they sold in stores. And people, you know, they went to stores to get Doom a lot. Uh, in, in fact, Doom was probably the only time I've ever seen this uh, before. Um, we wanted really wide distribution with the game, and we knew that lots of people went to stores to get software because back then the internet was very new, almost no one had it. Uh, BBSs were way more popular, but going to stores was the most popular. So, um, so with Doom, we we came up with this idea that I don't think anyone's done yet uh, again, um, which is we knew that you know we're giving the game away for free. We're it's shareware. We're putting the first episode of the game out there for free in episodes two and three. You would buy for thirty five bucks, and so uh, because we wanted really wide distribution, and we were not going to see get anything from that first episode from the first episode because it's free. We decided to tell everybody, all the distributors that actually were in CompUSA and EB that put discs on the shelf, we told them, put this game on the shelf. You can't charge more than $9.99, which we put on the title screen of Dooms. It's suggested price, retail price is $9.99. We told them, put it on a disc and put it on the shelf and you keep all the money. We don't want any of it. Because it's for free anyway, right? So when you go to so back then when you go to CompUSA, you saw ten different boxes of Doom from different companies on the shelf. So ten different they're all the same Doom, but they're all like who could make the best box? Because that's what you could basically buy. Is is the coolest looking box. The best screenshots, the you know, then they they have to like you know, outdo each other with the gore on the front or whatever. But you know, it was it was like there's Doom, there's Doom, there's Doom, there's Doom, and it's all the same. But we got super wide distribution, and this is the first time I ever saw the same game with ten boxes from ten, ten different companies in the in the stores. And we never did that again. But um, it got the game everywhere, you know, and, and people went retail. And that's and they started buying network uh, equipment back then because the game, uh, you could play Doom on a LAN. So lots of hard, uh, network cards and VNC cable uh, was, was being sold. Because that was the first time. That I just want to paint one little quick picture for you. I'm not sure how many of you are old enough to remember this, but in the Bay Area, you go to the Cow Palace and the shows and things like that where there are a lot of shareware share discs, these huge cardboard trays. You kind of flip through just like you, you know, would do with records or CDs or something like that, also things you probably don't remember. But anyway, <laughs> um, you would just flip through all these things. I think everything through probably shareware do that I got from its software, I got because I went over to one of these local flea market, flea market uh, shareware, computer show kind of things, and you would just go through this, and, oh wow, there's some new thing here, and you just buy it. They, they were ridiculously cheap. Uh, the guy, you know, the people had to make some money for having uh, done that, but they were just very cheap, and that's the way a lot of the software uh, in the early 90s was distributed. It was really amazing how much software you could get um, that way, and it was a lot of, of course, as always, it's a lot of fun to do that kind of thing. Okay. So, um, thinking about the way that the engine, uh, the Doom engine started propagating, um, and the fact that there's, like, there are probably people now making games using code that you wrote 20 years ago. Um, how does that, like, if you could go back and do anything differently, like, is there anything, in, and does that affect the way that you approach projects in the future? Just, like, how widespread the engine Um, what would we have changed? Uh, I think at the time we did everything that we could. Um, there was only, you know, we spent a year and we did as much as we could and even the networking got in during the last few months of the game because we spent so much time. Uh, yeah, these are, these are uh, sketches that Adrian Carmack just sent me um, from when we were making Doom. And uh, he basically, he still has all of his sketchbooks and everything, so like, Henry's just gonna show some of the stuff. The, the clay models and stuff that that, uh, that we made. <laughs> yeah, those characters are made from clay models. First the sketch, clay model created, and then scanned in. Um, but anyway, you know, we I don't think we would have done anything different. We did as much as we could, and then with Quake, we extended it even further because we had some more time. Um, but it, you know, I think you know, Doom did do a lot when it came out. It was it was you know, you could play deathmatch, you could modify it, you could challenge each other with time. Crazy distribution, 
Um, the engine was really neat. You know, people hadn't seen a game uh, that, that went that fast and, and looked like that. Um, and it really contrasted with Mist, which was state of the art for high res, high you know, high resolution and high color game. Um, and Doom was more about lower resolution uh, and fast. You know, we had to, that's, that's what we had to do. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll see you over there. Yeah. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, I'm curious if you talk a bit more about the uh, philosophy of map design, because uh, you know, it was kind of like really intricate 3D mazes at that time, and kind of as a follow-up to that, uh, why do you think we've deviated so far from that? Yeah, um, well, when we, when, like the a, a lot of times that there's nodes placed in a map in a game to give a lot of AI hints because these maps are 3D and they're pretty complex. Um, back when we made Doom, we had no, there were no hints inside the levels for AI. It was, they hit a wall and they just slide across the wall. But you don't usually see it because if you do see them, they're coming after you and so they're off the wall. So people actually never knew that the monsters were kind of hitting walls and sliding towards them. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, won't, I won't go into it uh, right now, but like uh, level design to me is a really huge subject. It's really big. I'll just say that uh, in, in making Doom levels, uh, it was pretty critical to have, um, you know, the lights were, were down very low in my room. I had, you know, uh, indirect cam lighting kind of stuff on, you know, overhead. And I would play usually Queen's Reich, um, you know, anything that that that, uh, that made made me feel the way I want my levels to feel as a player. So it'd be like, you know, if I if I'm making an area where there's like crazy combat, I'd be playing Judas Priest Painkiller or something. I could be, but there was a lot of heavy metal in making you know Doom and Quake. We we listened to it all the time. Alice in Chains as well. Um, but uh, but the, but setting the your uh, creative space up to reflect what you're trying to create was really important. So um, programming wasn't usually the same. Like, it was usually like kind of brighter in the room when we we're programming. But when I was doing level design, it was always <coughs> turned down. Music set specifically to reflect what I was trying to create. And um, and there's and there's just I think it's a that's a, a big topic to go into, which is because I think that that level design is. One of the you know most one of the most important things that you can do when you're creating a game. Do you have a favorite Doom plot, uh, like Um, I don't, I don't think I have any specific one. I couldn't actually name <clears throat> name one. I guess that was that was that I really liked. There's a lot of really amazing Doom levels out right now. Like it's the quality of of, of the crafting of these levels is crazy. Like these people know their data and they have no technical issues with it. If, if you actually, they take a, they take apart the, the levels that we made and, and see how sloppy they were. You know, because we actually, when in making the, um, the levels for Doom, uh, with the editor that I made on, on Next Step to create the levels, I wanted it to be really easy and fast to make the levels. Uh, and the levels had a bit of technical data with the wall, you know, the wall data, and then the sectors of the walls addressed because um, walls had two sides to them, uh, if it was a two-sided line. And so there was some technical data there, and in making a, a game, uh, you can't make a game quickly if you have to worry about all the little bit of details. So one of the things that we put into Doom was the flood filling of sector data. So I could basically right-click inside of an area and it would pick up the sector data and set the sector inspector up with that data. And I could flood fill somewhere else just with a click, and it would set all the wall data to that. And like, no level editor ever did that. Because we never actually told people how it worked on Next Step. They just saw the data and made the levels to match the data, the level editor to match the data, and that's how everybody did Doom levels. Um, and I was like, oh my god, they're setting the data on the lines manually? Oh my god. But like the people who are super technical, they they do that. They keep track of all the data. It's very clean, these, these levels nowadays that are made for deathmatch. Um, they're perfect, you know, and they're they look amazing. And um, we just, you know, we didn't do that back then. We were just trying to make, you know, trying to make something new, and it, and, and there ended up some sloppy data and some levels. Most people would never see it, but if you take it apart, you could see why is there a texture on the back of this line? No one will ever see it, you know. That's me making E1M7. Of, uh, you know. <laughs>
Um, well, we we were very happy to have people modify the game and release uh, release mods and even make money off of them. Um, so, other than that, I mean, that's pretty much everything. You know, <laughs> it's like what else? You know, if they sell it and they make money, you know, get mad about that. No, we 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 made our source open. We gave the source away for people to even modify the source code. Um, we did have the the hacker ethic, you know, that that uh, the entire time. I, like he, uh, Henry had mentioned, that Andre Lamont uh, in his books. Andre actually came to id, and we told him all about Wolfenstein's ray casting techniques. Like we were open about how we were creating our game. So even during the time of development of Doom, we would have people come to our office. And we would tell them how we're making the Doom engine. We just told them, you know, it's like you're not going to be able to get it done faster than us. So we will tell you everything that you want to know, and you can write a book about it or whatever. So we we talked to Andre. We talked to anybody. Tell them about what the game's about, and, and nowadays it's so different. Like nowadays, it's NDAs, and you can't talk about what you're doing or anything. But back then, it's our company. We'll talk about whatever we want. We'll just tell everybody even how we do it. And so we were super open, and then, which is the reason why open source for our, our games came out. Most people don't know how open we were, but we would tell anybody anything they wanted to know. So that we were super open in every way. Way up there, this. Uh, so kind of extending off of the previous question about levels, um, it seems like in modern games, something like rocket jumping would be squashed by an executive producer who didn't want a bunch of content to get skipped. Um, have we sort of lost our way, or do you have any suggestions to modern shooter creators regarding letting players make those kinds of speed runs or new usage of content? Yeah, well, um, I think it's changing. I think it's kind of coming back around now. But for a long time, with Call of Duty and games like that, uh, those games have such high production values and costs that they can't afford to have players jump off the, the path, basically, and go explore areas that would cost so much money to QA and fix, right? Because players would do crazy things, and so those, game, those, those areas of the levels are, they have these massive you know, collision brushes to keep the player within the corridor. So you can see neat stuff, but you just can't actually interact with it. And, um, and it's because of the crazy cost of these things. So nowadays it's gotten better. Um, they've created better you know, engines that, that handle it better um, to be able to uh, go ahead and explore these open worlds. And so they, they've kind of come back to the, yeah, people really want to explore stuff. Um, let's, let's see if we can go back to making it you know, reasonable to develop a game uh, to, to do that. But you can see these games are still taking like five years to make. You know, like they're still taking a long time to create all that content that is explorable, but it's something I think all the players want to do because you could do it back then, you know. Um, so I'm glad that it's kind of coming back. You know, as I mentioned, one of my interests is uh, Machinima. I've written a fair amount on it, and the, uh, we had a conference a few years ago uh, about Machinima and the law at Stanford, and we brought in Machinima artists and so on. And we also brought in some lawyers from game companies to talk about what the problem was, you know, from their point of view. One thing that stuck in my mind, I won't name the company, was uh, one of the lawyers said, you know, uh, we have to protect our intellectual property. For example, what if somebody makes a machinima uh, about our game and explores some aspect of the story, you know, some uh, side story in the game, but it turns out that we've actually been developing that story. Uh, if we let the machinima maker do it ahead of us, we've basically given up the intellectual property, and we could we have to stop making that part of the game. And uh, at that point, it, you know, that one was really not being in game development myself. Uh, I thought that was uh, quite hypothetical, but it shows you <laughs> <laughs> it shows you kind of a little bit, you know, gives you a little insight into the logic that might have been there. And I'm, you know, I, I'm glad to see a lot of things that are happening. I still wonder, you know, like the demo format, the format that made Machine Mode possible. When I see now how even replays in some games are very tightly controlled, you know, that you can't really get at the thing, uh, you know, where is it exactly um, on my computer, all the, all the difficulties that are thrown up there, you know, I kind of feel like some of the lessons, the lessons of the PC games of the 1990s and the earlier, remember there were open games, academic games, and all sorts of things, the Apple II games that John worked on were also basically open platforms. And a lot of the lessons that were learned about the kind of cultural economy you can foster 
have been lost to a certain extent, but I'm sure they'll come back. I'm sure there's, there's sort of a cyclical nature to all of this. Do we? Yeah, we have about one minute. If somebody had like a date they wanted to ask about one question, quickie. Yeah, okay. <coughs> if uh, we take that down the picture today, will he start in my shooter? <laughs> will he what? Will he start his career in my shooter? David, got the picture? Yeah. Today, yeah. will he start his career doing a shooter? Oh, he's starting his career with a shooter. <laughs> um, well, if he's working on a Doom map, I'd say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shooter. Um, but are you talking about if I today was starting? Are you talking about uh, my shooters? career? Yeah. 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 Oh, would I start making shooters if I started today? Um, probably. I mean, they're pretty fun. <laughs> I was after excitement, so yeah. Shooters are very exciting. <laughs>